Missing time is one of these things that many people have experienced, not everyone, but there's a, a certain percentage, people that have had experiences. They remember, you know, driving down the road, say at 7.30 p.m. And the next thing they know, it's 10.45 p.m. And they're still driving down the road, but they're at a different location and they don't remember that time piece in between. Or, or like me, you have an experience and then it's the next morning and you don't know what happened in between. You don't remember the end of that experience. It's very, very common. And what's happening in that so-called missing time, it's not that the time is literally missing, it's that you're missing. You're missing your own awareness from the timeline. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Shifting Dimensions. I'm your host, Jumi Moses. And on the show with me today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Bertie Jaworski. She is the founder of Albuquerque UFO slash UAP Explorations and is the most active UFO group in the entire country. Bertie, welcome to Shifting Dimensions. Thank you, Jumi. I am so excited to be here. I love talking about all things UFO. Yes. And I have so much to learn about this topic, right? I think I know the basics, like UFO stands for unidentified flying objects. And then UAP yes. is this new acronym that I've been hearing a lot. So uh, can you tell us what the difference is between UFO and UAP or are they like interchangeable terms? They're kind of interchangeable. UFO has been used for decades everyone knows ufo means unidentified flying objects and when people think of the word ufo they think of a flying saucer a disc shaped object that's hovering that's uh, sucking up a cow into its underbelly that's maybe uh, abducting you and probing you in some way but the phenomenon the ufo phenomenon is so much richer and more interesting than that and what's happened over the past few years, really since 2017, when um, some Navy pilots went public and talked about their UFO sightings, the, the acronym was changed to UAP, which is Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. And that is because it's not necessarily flying objects. It is unidentified aerial phenomena, meaning it could encompass things that are there and not there in a split second. It could encompass all kinds of things around the flying objects themselves. And honestly, but what I honestly think, okay, that's like the explanation that everyone gives. <laughs> But the reality is they were just trying to rename it to make it more palatable to, to the public. I mean, that's truly what's going on here. UAP sounds more scientific and that's what all the researchers and scientists are using today. But I gosh darn love the old UFO term. <laughs> <laughs> no, UFO is nice. And you're right. Like when I think about UFO, I think about the flying discs in the air. Right. But I, I see why the UAP, UAP kind of captures uh, more of any sort of extraterrestrial phenomena. So that makes a lot of sense. Right. Um, yeah. So recently, you know, it's funny. I think Harvard just released a study about UFOs and UAPs because yes. it's this thing be the, the public was gaslit about for a long time. Now, all of a sudden you have the government talking about it. And then now you have like big entities like Harvard talking about it. You even have the Catholic church talking about it. Like everyone's talking about it. Right. So I don't know if you're you've heard about the Harvard study, but basically the paper suggests um, extraterrestrials could be living underground or inside the moon. I heard people say that before. And normally people would say that was crazy. But now that you have an academic source bringing it up, I'm sure people are like tuning in a little bit more and thinking it's less crazy. And like I said, the Catholic Church talking about it and then the government talking about it more. Why do you think that is? Why do you think now everyone wants to kind of you know, bring this to the collective consciousness. It's, we're really in an extraordinary time right now. Uh, you bring up the Harvard study, and this was spearheaded by a professor, a very famous man, Dr. Avi Loeb. He works at Harvard. He is the head of the Astro 
physics department. And he cut into this whole subject because there was a strange rock that traveled into our solar system and was captured by the sun's gravity and then was expelled from our solar system. And this rock was called Umamua. And this was a few years back. And he looked at this rock and looked at the data concerned with the uh, astronomical um, observations of this rock. It was a long, skinny, almost cylindrical rock-like object. And he wondered, could this possibly be an alien probe from another civilization? Because it didn't follow, it didn't seem to look like or follow the same trajectory or have the same composition of other um, pieces of material that wander into our solar system. And most scientists are agreed that this object came from outside of our solar system. This is from something else in our galaxy. And Dr. Avi Loeb um, postulated that this is an alien probe and it sent him down the UFO rabbit hole. And now he is writing about this topic as in the paper that you brought up and talking about all the different possibilities that could be here. And um, so, so we're kind of in an interesting time where scientists, researchers of all kinds, uh, military individuals, and even our own United States Congress has an absolute fascination with this topic. Uh, if you look at what's been happening in our Congress, we have had hearings in the House where different um, expert witnesses have been brought forward from the Navy talking about their own encounters with UFOs during training exercises. We even had a hearing in the House where a whistleblower who had been working on the, on the government's official UFO program um, now was now coming forward and talking about how he has talked with at least 40 witnesses who have firsthand evidence that not only have we seen craft in the sky, but the government has collected crashed flying saucers and what he termed biologics, meaning alien bodies that they are now examining, they're reverse engineering the craft. It's an extraordinary time right now. Yeah, it's extremely fascinating. And it's, I think it's one of those things where it can't really be hidden anymore because you have, you know, regular people, average civilians who are having encounters. And I want to talk to you more about the anatomy of an encounter, right, a little bit later. But I want to kind of backtrack and start with you, right? Where did, where did this start for you, right? Because I feel like you're so passionate about this that I would love to know, when did you start thinking about aliens and, and where did the passion come from? It actually started when I was seven years old. And this is over 50 years ago, mind you, it was the year 1972. And it was Christmas time, the break, the school break, the Christmas break. And my sister and I were playing in our bedroom and we had been playing with our Christmas presents, which of course, this is 1972, you have to understand. And we had received Lone Ranger and Tonto dolls for Christmas. Now I know Tonto is offensive these days, so I'm really sorry about even saying that, but we had Lone Ranger and Tonto dolls and we were playing with our dolls and it was nighttime. It was like early evening around seven, eight o'clock at night, it was dark outside and the snow was lightly falling outside our window and in through the window, all of a sudden appeared this blue gray beam of light. It's actually giving me goosebumps just talking about it now. And my sister and I kind of dropped our dolls and we looked at this beam of light. It's coming in through a window and it was coming from this metallic dull gray, huge disc-like object. We could only see a portion of it through the window. You could tell it was a disc because we could see the outside the leading edge of it. We couldn't see the rest. And it was just hovering there. And all of a sudden our two dolls, they stood up by themselves and started spinning in opposite directions in this beam of light. 
And that's literally the last thing my sister and I remember. My sister is a year younger than me. I was seven years old at the time. She was six. And we didn't know what it was. In the next morning, I ran to my mom and said, mom, 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 this happened last night. And I described it to her. And my mom said, oh, you had a nightmare. And my sister and I were just kind of giving each other the side eye thinking, you know, that wasn't a nightmare. Something real happened, but we were kids. It was our early 1970s. We didn't have a basis for understanding what, what this even could be. We grew up Catholic. So I, I didn't even know the word UFO. I didn't even have a, an understanding of like the idea of aliens or anything that wasn't even human. So for a long time, it was just a strange experience. And my sister and I called it the night the dolls danced for a long time until I was older and started reading some science fiction in my teens. And then I thought, oh my gosh, that was a UFO. And that's what started me on this, down this whole rabbit hole, this whole journey. Yeah, it's really fascinating that a lot of the things yeah. that become our passion are always planted when we're children. Um, yeah. So I've, I've heard so many people talk about encounters, right? It, it, you clearly had an encounter when you were seven. Um, so are all encounters similar? I'm, I'm sure they're different, right? I, I hear people say that they were abducted when they, they sleep. I hear people have encounters similar to yours. So can you just talk to me a little bit more about what encounters are like and how can someone determine if they've actually had an encounter? Encounters, it's complicated. There are so many different kinds of encounters. And in that first encounter when I was seven, wasn't my only encounter. I had a second one in my teen years when I was uh, 16 years old. And so I'll tell you this story, then I'll, then I'll tell you a little more or about encounters in general, because this one was a little different, but in some ways similar, because there are some similarities and some differences. So uh, when I was 16, I was at a sleepover. And again, strangely enough, it was over Christmas vacation. Now, all encounters don't happen over Christmas break. <laughs> and I don't even know if this was a coincidence or not. That's the whole mystery here. You know, why do these things happen? Why do they happen to certain people? But um, I was at a sleepover with six other girls, uh, at a girlfriend's house, typical slumber party. And we were playing truth or dare, like, like young girls did back then. I don't know if they do it these days. We were playing truth or dare. And so in truth or dare, you are asked a question. You can answer with the truth, or you can take the dare if you don't want to answer the question. And I didn't want to answer the question because the question was about a boy I liked. And so I wanted to take the dare. So I took the dare and the dare was, I had to run around the whole backyard naked in the snow, singing the theme to the love boat, which was super popular then. So I ripped off my clothes, started running outside. All the girls were laughing and I started seeing love, amazing and true and running around the whole backyard around the perimeter of these pine trees through this crunchy snow, old snow and this big, huge diamond shaped object. It wasn't a saucer. It was enormous. It was way bigger than the saucer I saw when I was seven. When people say they saw a football field sized UFO, that's kind of a typical thing people say. This was a football field size UFO, it was orange. And it glowed from within. It didn't seem to have a light source. It just was glowing. And it it hovered over, moved slowly over this row of pine trees. And I stopped and the last thing I remember was thinking I could pick up a pine cone and chuck it at it and it would hit it. It's the last thing I remember the next morning, the, all the girls and myself were sitting around the breakfast table, the parents were making us pancakes and my friends who, whose house it was, dad said, what were you guys into the makeup last night? Your faces are all red. And it's true. Our faces were like bright red, like we were sunburned, but we didn't remember what happened. And it was only actually at high school graduation when my best friend had too much to drink at the part after party and she was barfing in a bush and I was holding her hair back and it was something about the light through the trees and the bush. And I just remembered. And I said, oh my gosh, 
do you remember Terry's sleepover party? And then she remembered, she's like, the UFO. And then we got everyone together who was, there was like four of us there that, that were at that party. We got together and we talked about it all night. But that's kind of a typical encounter where you have a sighting, you see something, you feel something, you experience something, and maybe you don't remember it or you don't remember all of it. Many people have these kinds of experiences. And, and today, people still have these kinds of kinds of experiences. What researchers have said is that the phenomenon seems to follow people through generations, through family lines. I don't know if that's true. I, you know, all this stuff is so mysterious, who knows? So yeah. there are all kinds of different, different experiences. You could see something, you could have that missing time. Like I had two times in my life, or you could maybe see something, take a photo. Maybe the photo doesn't come out so great because, mm -hmm. you know, our phones only have so much resolution and it's, who knows what's going on. Can you talk to me a little bit more about the missing time piece? Cause I find that so fascinating. People have talked about like just having a lapse in time and not knowing or having any sort of idea of what happened. I've also heard about people who've had dreams of being like poked and prodded and yes. then waking up, but feeling like that wasn't a dream either. So if you could start with the, the time lapse piece and then also the encounters that are more like abductions that I hear a lot more about. So missing time is one of these things that many people have experienced, not everyone, but there's a, a certain percentage, people that have had experiences, they remember you know, driving down the road, say at 7 30 PM. And the next thing they know it's 10 45 PM and they're still driving down the road, but they're at a different location and they don't remember that time piece in between or, or like me, you have an experience and then it's the next morning and you don't know what happened in between. You don't remember the end of that experience. It's very, very common. And what's happening in that so-called missing time. It's not that the time is literally missing. It's that you're missing. You're missing your own awareness from the timeline. And what happens in that space is a mystery. Now, people have a choice to go under some kind of hypnotic regression and perhaps pull some kind of memory out of their subconscious. And that's controversial. You know, there are a, a number of talented hypnotherapists who have advanced degrees who are very good at this, who work in all kinds of clinical settings outside of alien, I'll put that in quotation marks, experiences, um, who do this kind of work. And people who have undergone hypnotic regression report really interesting things. They say that they have been brought into an alien spaceship, perhaps, Perhaps they've undergone medical procedures. They may have been given information. Uh, one thing that's common in a lot of these, I'll call them abduction experiences, is they're giving they're given information about environmental disaster on the Earth. They're told that we need to take care of our planet. They're shown things like nuclear war. It's an ongoing thing, which is very fascinating. And, but, but whether these things are, are something coming from a person's subconscious because they're trying to fill in the blanks or whether it was a real experience, I don't know. I've never undergone hypnotic regression for my, my two experiences. I've never, I've never wanted to, to be honest, because so many people that have done this have had horrific memories or and I don't know how real those are, to be yeah. honest. I just yeah. don't know. I've heard that before, that people who do any sort of hypnotic regression, they unearth horrific memories that just really shake them up. And so I, I can imagine that yes. if you remember enough, you don't need to go under um, and potentially pull out more um horrific memories. Hopefully that wasn't the case for you. But, you know, it's interesting and I, I consider these things fascinating because I do believe 
that they have to be true to some extent because too many people say it, right? And when people talk about whether it's an abduction or an encounter, whatever you want to call it, people always think these people might be crazy, right? But I'm not one of those people. I just feel like if if some if people are saying things too many times, right? Whether or not I can even fathom that reality, there has to be some level of truth to it. And I think we live in a society that just subscribes insanity to people without really, you know, doing like trying to figure out like that person's experience. So the reason why I'm bringing that up is because a lot of these conversations are still considered crazy by a lot of people or like why are you even bothered by this? And the more crazy part of this argument argues that the Bible is filled with aliens, that they're not talking about a God, they're talking about aliens, right? Which is this new conversation that's getting a lot of momentum. And I just want to hear your thoughts on that. As a UFO UAP researcher, what are your thoughts on people saying that they were most likely aliens in the Bible and not the God that people think of. What's interesting is if you look back at all of human experience from the very first moments of recorded history, whether it's petroglyphs on a wall or oral histories that have been um, brought down over generations, we have these stories over and over and over again about supernatural beings who come from the heavens and who give us things, give us fire, give us the tools to understand agriculture. There are drawings in many, many places across the entire planet, ancient drawings that seem to depict flying craft or strange looking creatures. Now, whether these are aliens or coming from some extraterrestrial civilization, who knows? knows. But what's really interesting today is the work the Catholic Church is doing as, as someone who grew up Catholic uh, in, in a family that was extraordinarily Catholic, uh, you know, Polish and Italian family. I mean, we were going to church almost every day. And it's so interesting to me to see even just a couple of weeks ago, the Catholic Church had a press, a press conference because they were talking about the supernatural. They had made some decisions on how they were going to happen, how they were going to handle the supernatural, because it's not just having to do with aliens. It's having to do with all supernatural phenomenon, because many people across the planet report seeing things like the Virgin Mary or Jesus or other saints and angels. And the Catholic church has decided that they need to make a statement on how they're going to handle these kinds of um, so-called apparitions and their statement was, it was very holistic and, and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't that scandalous. They, they essentially said that private revelation is private revelation and people are welcome to, you know, believe what they want to believe about their own experiences, but they're not going to put a stamp, an official stamp on anyone's private revelation, which I think is a reasonable take for the Catholic church. However, in the questions asked by the press, uh, a reporter did ask and apologize for asking, which was kind of interesting about the UFO phenomenon and the bishop or the cardinal that gave the response said, well, it is possible that many of these things actually are from UFOs. It's essentially what he said. And I think that the church, I mean, they have an official Vatican astronomer, the astronomer himself. I mean, these are all men. Let's, let's be real. <laughs> it's a patriarchal, it's a patriarchal religion. <laughs> and the man said, you know, I mean, the man is, the Vatican astronomer has talked at length about how there could be alien civilizations. And if they are visiting us, well, then we're going to baptize them. So the Catholic Church, I think, is is the big church that has gotten on board the whole extraterrestrial phenomenon, the whole UFO deal. I think that they feel that that we're coming into a new age where this is going to be revealed. We've we've got 
decades now of hidden history that the government has hidden from us. And it's time now to bring the full the Catholic church because they don't want to lose the donations. They don't want to lose the flock. So I think yeah. it's smart. It's smart optics. I think for the church to be talking about these things. Yeah. They definitely don't want to lose the flock. It's fascinating that that was the answer that he gave. Cause you know, a lot of people would argue that the Catholic church would has a sense of the beings in the Bible because people always say that the Bible is used as a mode for control and all that stuff. So why do you think a lot of people struggle with the idea of the possibilities of extraterrestrials being in existence, right? Because one thing that has always bothered me with religion, and I don't think religion is bad. I think, again, I'm not an extremist. I'm not like yes or no, black or white. That's not who I am. I'm always kind of trying to find the middle ground. But one thing that I struggled with in terms of religion is the fact that people would always talk about God and human beings. And I was like, okay, but like, what about the other beings God created that aren't necessarily on this planet? And people would look at me like, what? That's, that's, that's not a thing, you know? So anyways, I just want to know, why do you think a lot of people struggle with the possibility of extraterrestrials being in existence. I think that that's kind of a modern um, sociological construct, honestly, because if you look at, now see, I live in New Mexico, for example, and we have many indigenous populations here. We have a number of Native American populations and Pueblos and almost across the board, all of these different Native American cultures, they revere or what they call the sky people. There are numerous names for, for um, beings that they believe have come down and helped us or help, help birth our human family. It's really a beautiful, beautiful um, stories that they tell. And so in different cultures, they don't have that same kind of approach, that same kind of fear or, or belief that we're completely alone. I think that's a modern construct. And I believe that that does come from religion, to be quite honest, because if you look, I mean, even looking back at Galileo, he was, he was cursed, right? By the Catholic church for not believing that the earth was the center of the universe. It truly wasn't right. We, we, we revolve around the sun and the sun isn't even the center of the universe. It's on a it's on a flailing arm on the edge of the Milky Way galaxy. We're not even close to the center of our own galaxy. And there are billions of galaxies out there. We are puny people on a little blue dot just flying through space. But I think that, you know, our modern culture, modern Western culture has this idea that we are so cool and so powerful and uh, honestly, I think it's a more patriarchal um, sense of being, you know, it's kind of disconnected from the earth and from the sky and from this whole sense of who, who we are as beings on this planet. It's a sense more of, it's a power stance. I think it's a power stance. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I think it's one of those situations where I wonder how people would look at themselves differently in the lives that they're living mm -hmm. differently if they realize that it wasn't just us in this existence, right? That this existence right. is far beyond what we can even conceptualize. And I think that would shake up a lot of belief systems, dogmatic belief systems, right? So, you know, we're, we're all looking for foundation. I think I always say this, we're all looking for something that makes us feel important, right? Makes us feel like our life is we're living life the right way. And I think that whether it's religion or whatever, like ideologies people hold on to, I think give them that sense of security. And I think talking about extraterrestrials could potentially shake up that security. But to me, it gives me more security because it makes me make sense of life. I'm like, oh, okay. So if I understand this, right, and then, you know, the whole idea of like reincarnation and all that stuff comes into to play, it makes me feel like, oh, OK, so there's a rhyme and reason to this. This is not just random. There's like intentionality here. Right. Um, because I think a lot of the conversations around UFOs kind of close a lot of gaps 
that religion isn't able to answer, right? It closes a lot of gaps that science isn't able to answer. And I just think it's important for us to kind of look into it more, not just believe things blindly, of course, but definitely be open to those answers and, you know, th those possibilities as well. So um, with all of that being said, I just want to know, what do you think the implications are of the disclosure, right? Like, why do you think the government is disclosing this now? What do you think their long-term plan is with tr trying to get the general public to kind of wrap their heads around the idea of UFOs? That is such a good question. It's such a good question because for decades and, and we, you know, we'll go back to Roswell, 1947. Everyone calls that kind of the birth of the modern area uh, era of ufology and the birth of the cover-up because something happened in Roswell. It was printed in the paper the next day that a flying disc was recovered. And then the paper retracted that and said that the, that the army and the president of the United States, you know, and all of his minions said that it was a weather balloon. And since then there has been this grand cover up. And I know people kind of wrinkle their eyebrows and say, Oh, you're a conspiracy theorist, but there truthfully has been a cover up. And if you look at the history of the CIA and other kinds of things, they were developed directly after the Roswell incident to manipulate public opinion on all of these kinds of issues. And the word conspiracy theorist actually comes from the CIA directly as an actual plan to discredit people. So there's all of these kinds of interesting things that have happened since 1947, but but the public in general, unless you were into UFOs, unless you had a passion about it, or unless you saw something yourself, most likely you didn't believe in it. You thought it was something nutty. But then in 2017, everything changed. There was an article that came out in the New York Times, and it was above the fold in the paper by Leslie Kane and Ralph Blumenthal. And it was a story that included included three different videos online of unidentified flying craft, which they started calling UAP at that time, unidentified aerial phenomenon. These were all captured by Navy pilots and by Navy equipment showing strange tic tac they called them tic tacs, which was uh, named by Commander David Fravor, one of the Navy pilots who saw one of these things up close. It was 40 feet long, looked like a big old Tic Tac, those candies, mints, flying through the air. It flew underwater and seemed to be flying to some huger ship that was underwater that they could, they could kind of see underwater was glowing. And, and so in 2017, that's when the modern disclosure era started. People were captivated by this, but not enough people. It was kind of interesting at the time because I was like texting. I have five children, mind you. I was texting all my kids. They're all grown ups. I was texting everybody I know saying, look, I was right. I was right. I told you so. I told you so. And they were all like, what mom, what? And the public kind of sighed. But since then, there's been this disclosure movement that's been rolling along. And now the U.S. Congress is involved. And this past year, something absolutely extraordinary happened. We had the Schumer Rounds Amendment, which was um, Senator uh, Schumer, Senator Rounds got together, Democrat and Republican. And, and they wrote this incredible 64 page document that they put forth as put forth as part of the legislation in, you know, and it was voted down, but it's up again now in a, in a new form and Senator Schumer, he's the head of the Senate talked about in this document, he mentioned non-human intelligence Multiple times, he mentioned biologics, multiple times, meaning alien bodies. He talked about crash craft. 
it was an incredible piece of legislation that asked, asked Congress to force the Department of Defense and other arms of the government to actually bring forward this information that has been hidden from the American public for so long. And now we have whistleblowers coming forward like David Grush and others. And we're in the throes of it now. And it's so interesting. I think what's most interesting to me is how many people are still not aware of this, even though it's been in the news. Yeah, a lot of people aren't aware of it. Or maybe yeah. they are, but you know, it's one of those situations where we filter out things that we don't understand. So I could see a lot of people doing that. But, you know, I've also heard that the reason why this disclosures are happening, you know, if we want to go down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole, the reason why these disclosures are happening, people are saying that it's because maybe the government has like some sort of agenda where in the future they might say, oh, well, we're going to war, war or developing these you know, weapons because we're trying to protect you or we want to be able to defend ourselves against these extraterrestrials. Have you heard that argument? And do you think that's a possibility? Well, the national security argument is kind of the number one argument that, that Congress has been putting forth and that multiple people involved in the disclosure movement have been putting forth saying that there is an issue with national security and it's multi-layered perhaps say, say we have crashed craft, say the United States government is in possession of crashed craft that they've given to defense contractors to reverse engineer, to create new weapons, to use against our adversaries. Well, that's national security. Suppose that they understand what, what this whole phenomenon is about, because I don't understand what it's about, but maybe they know where these things come from. Maybe they feel that these things have a malicious intent. Well, that could be classified under national security. I mean, you could pretty much take any aspect of this and classify it as national security. And if you do that, then you're keeping all of it from the American public under, under a threat level that, that you may feel is appropriate. But in reality, don't we as human beings, as people on this beautiful planet, don't we have a right to know who's visiting us, who's part of our world? Don't we have a right to know these things? I think that that's my perspective, that national security is not an important enough reason to keep this from the American public public or from the world public, not just Americans, from the worldwide public. This is a global issue and it should be something that we as a human family should be involved in exploring and understanding. Apparently they've been with us since the dawn of time, according to cave paintings and oral history. So why shouldn't we know what's happening? I think in a real ideal world, that would be amazing. I do think some people would go into hysterics over it, right? Because when human beings don't understand something, the default setting is fear, right? Um, yes. And I think that people like you who are doing the research, who've had the encounters, you're not as scared as other people, right? You don't necessarily see extraterrestrials as these nefarious beings, but- it, you know, it begs the question, should we be scared of increased encounters or increased contact? Because I feel like it's becoming more part of the collective consciousness and it's, it's you know, entering the discourse because it's becoming more obvious that extraterrestrials are among us, you know? Um, so should we be worried I don't think we need to be worried. There there have been some really interesting things that people have been pointing out. Just if you look at all the research, one thing that's absolutely fascinating is that all of our nuclear facilities, all of the nuclear power plants and places where we have nuclear weapons, the silos, the command centers, all of these places have been visited many, many times over by UFOs. This is part of the historical record. And there are many whistleblowers who have already come out 
and talked about this, such as Robert Salas, who was um, stationed at one of these locations and uh, describes an incredible encounter that multiple people have, have corroborated. So what's happened is that whatever these craft are, or whatever these entities are, they seem to be super interested in our nuclear facilities. They seem to be turning them on and off at will. And they've given people these messages that this is really terrible for us. So, so I think that whatever's happening out there, they seem to be super concerned about at the very least our planet, maybe not us as a species, but they seem to be concerned with what we're doing here and how we're harming things. And whether that means they may be aggressive toward us because we are the terrible, you know, we've got claws and we're angry and we can't even get along with each other on this planet. So maybe they have it out for us. I don't know, but I don't think we need to be afraid because they've been with us forever. They seem to be concerned about our planet and maybe we should listen to that message. Yes. And, you know, I think there are probably some extraterrestrials who have good intentions and potentially want to help humanity. I've heard that. And then there might be some disagreeable extraterrestrials that are more self-serving, right? A lot of people say that right. they're um, what, shape-shifting ETs in running the government, right? I've heard that even in Hollywood, <laughs> um, a lot of like rich people could potentially be reptilians and all of that stuff, which is, you know, fascinating. But even just human beings in general, a lot of people argue that we are quote unquote star seeds, right? So that's where reincarnation comes into play here, where it's like a lot of us have lived lives on other planets as extraterrestrials. And now we are in human bodies, but we are not really, not a lot of us originated from earth, right? We might have come from other star systems. Do you talk about this at all with other people who are part of your group who research into these things? And, and what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Absolutely. There is good evidence that, that our genetic line going back, you know, many, many, many generations and hundreds of thousands of years was manipulated in some way. Scientists can't understand why we made these incredible leaps to become the humans, the human beings that we are, the homo sapiens that we are. It's, it's a mystery. And some people have been told and shown that, that we actually are part of this ancient lineage that goes back to other civilizations on other planets, perhaps. There are all kinds of theories out there. And I, I believe that there's something there that, that we're more than our body, that what we've been, what we've been given you know, over, over many, many, many eons has to do with what's out there. I think that we're all part of this magnificent universe. And so why wouldn't we all be connected? Why wouldn't we all want to understand each other, love each other, get to know each other and just celebrate that we're all alive. We're all, we're all here in this amazing existence. It's a beautiful thing. It's absolutely beautiful. And, you know, I think we all kind of, most of us have a sense of that. I think that's why we're, a lot of people are drawn to the stars, whether it's astrology or even with this whole, you know, race to space and all of that stuff. And again, just speaking of race to space, what, what are your thoughts of, about, you know, trying to colonize Mars and, you know, all of the work that Elon Musk, for example, is doing? any sort of new findings or insights into to that work? I think colonizing Mars is still a little ways away. I actually saw this morning an interesting scientific report that shows that any humans that attempt to make it to Mars, that the radiation would completely kill their kidneys, which of course we need to function in, in these particular bodies, right? So. I don't know. I think that that's a ways away, but I celebrate anyone who is willing to go forward and, and try to move off this planet and experience all the beautiful things out there. I think there are many ways to 
um, experience what's out there, including using your own consciousness, remote viewing, all these kinds of things. So we're explorers. Yes. We're amazing. We are amazing creatures. And we are we're, we're trying to get it. Yeah. And and I know that you're based in New Mexico, but I'm curious to know, do you do any sort of research into any sort of sightings or UFO phenomena from different parts of the world, right? Because a lot of the sightings I hear about obviously are from the US, but we know that there are sightings across the globe. So how, do you look into those sightings as well? And do they differ yeah. from the ones that you hear about in the US? There are sightings literally everywhere on the planet there isn't a isn't a single place there have been sightings at the north pole there have been sightings in antarctica and every single country on the planet people have reported sightings and they're all so similar now there are differences between sightings sometimes pe people encounter things that they feel are terrifying sometimes people encounter things that they feel are beautiful and maybe that has more to do with how you feel as a human being and how you understand the unknown, but who knows? I, I, I don't think that there's one kind of entity that's visiting us. I think there's probably multiple kinds. And so it's like you said earlier, some may be beautiful and wonderful and uplifting and wanting to help us in our journey here as human beings, our human family, and some maybe. Maybe they want to steal things from our planet and uh, probe us and do horrible things. Who knows? It's just like, it's just like our own human family. We are, we are quite a mix of emotions and actions. Yes, we are, and it's fascinating. It's I always wonder, you know, with extraterrestrials, they're probably more advanced beings. They probably went through similar cycles that we are currently going through here on earth and they've transcended certain things in terms of technology and communication and maybe like understanding themselves as a species. So it's, it's always fascinating just kind of wanting to understand their motivations. And there's so many of them I've heard so many different types of extraterrestrials. It's not just like one group from, you know, one planet or from one star system, which is so fascinating, even with astrology. Now um, there's this new, I don't know if it's new, but it's, it's gaining momentum, which is um, uh, what's the word galactic astrology, right. Which looks into right, different right. star systems. And it's kind of like a mix between getting a past lives reading and an astrology reading at the same time. It's like a merger of both of those. So all of this stuff is, you know, just, it's just so fascinating. And again, I just think it adds a lot of context into a lot of the changes that we are currently seeing in the world right now. And I think it just has to be a part of the larger conversation. So thank you so much for sharing your oh, expertise you. on this. This is fascinating. And I would love to have you back on the show to dive deeper into so many different avenues regarding this, because there's so many directions to go when it comes to this. But I have to ask you, have you shifted in perspective on anything recently? I had an absolutely enormous shift actually this past weekend. So my dad came to visit me and my dad is in his 80s. And I grew up super Catholic. My dad was super Catholic and we went to church almost every day and he was hard on me. I was the oldest. He was super hard on me. And I have four younger sisters and it was, it's just a tough time for me. I had to take care of my sisters. I had to be a good Catholic girl. And for a long time, for decades, even my dad and I didn't have a good relationship. I was angry about the past and angry about the things that he said to me when I was a kid and how he treated me. And my dad came to visit this past weekend and it was absolutely beautiful. I'm, I'm a beekeeper at home. I have got three beehives in my backyard. And I had my dad suit up in a, bee, in a beekeeper suit and he went into the hives with me and we watched all these bees, which are kind of like alien creatures, right? They're so different than humans running around the hive and they're all women, which is also really interesting. My dad always wanted a boy and had five girls. And so all the 
bees were working so hard in the hive, tending to the queen. And my dad, he had a breakdown. It was beautiful. He, he had this amazing experience watching how I cared for these little creatures that are pollinating our beautiful planet and helping us grow, grow food to eat. And my dad understood me in that moment. We had a long, beautiful conversation after we closed the hives and took off our equipment. It was glorious. So my dad and I got closer this weekend. So it was a huge shift in I'm perspective for both me and my dad. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. I'm so what a profound moment. Mm. Um, you know, I I've been paying more attention to like animals, insects, and all that stuff, and just watching how they navigate the world. It truly is phenomenal, and I'm I'm happy that that moment really touched your dad, and that whole moment brought you guys closer. So that sounds amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that shift. Where can people find you if they want to learn more about your recent research or findings as it relates to UFOs and UAPs? Yeah. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out A B Q U F O S A B Q UFOs. The ABQ stands for Albuquerque. So it's abqufos.com and we are ABQ UFOs on all social media. Yeah. And we have five to 10 events a month. Many of them are online. So everyone everywhere is welcome to join us. It's all free. Everything's free. We're a nonprofit organization and we're just trying to build a community. That's our, that's our goal to build community of people who want to understand and learn about this phenomenon and share it with others. Thank you so much, Bertie, for stopping you. by Shifting Dimensions.